Welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing today? We've already been having a good time, haven't we? <laughs> the, the, the pre-session jabbing and, yeah, no. See how, how much we can uh, mess up with Mike's mind, you know, before the session starts and everything? Well, welcome, and, and thank you for coming. My name is Mike Friesenegger, and I'm a solution architect uh, at SUSE working with the Global IBM Alliance. So what does that mean? That means that uh, I have the opportunity to think eat, breathe, sleep, IBM, and every aspect of IBM, um, and how our two companies can work more closely together. So whether it be IBM Z and Linux One, which they were you know, downstairs, hopefully you stopped by and saw the Rock Hopper 2, IBM Power Systems, yeah, hopefully you stopped by the booth and was able to see HANA and HANA system replication and, and all that. IBM TSS, our TSS friends had a, a session earlier today talking about how IBM can help customers support their, their four walls and everything in their data center and up to 30, over 30,000 different products. And I am going somewhere with this, IBM Cloud. Um, and and uh, that's what I'm going to actually be talking about today is some things that uh, I've been able to do uh, with, well, with and using IBM Cloud um, and, and specifically um, lessons that I've learned as we worked on deploying SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage in IBM Cloud. So I have no demonstrations. I have screenshots, and, but um, I want to make this an interactive session, so please feel free to ask questions. Um, any question is open. I'll do my best to answer it. If I don't have the answer, I will I'll find you with a beer in hand later, and I'll give you the answer. No, but please feel free to ask any questions. So very quickly. Um, you know, we don't just do things just to do things. You know, there, there, um, there is a reason why we went down this path of trying to install SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage in IBM Cloud, in, in a public cloud provider. And so I'd like to take a few moments and talk to you about the application that, drove, that is driving this requirement and drove this requirement and things like that. And then give you a little bit of introduction to um, the public cloud provider, and I've already spilled the beans, it's IBM Cloud. Um, you know, up, up until um, this point, um, I hadn't really had the opportunity to do much with IBM Cloud hands-on. I've had the opportunity to talk with people at IBM Cloud. Tim here is one of the uh, IBM Cloud engineers, um, so uh, uh, welcome. Um, but uh, I would like to give a, a, a brief introduction of the things that I learned um, working with IBM Cloud. And then um, really get into the meat of the discussion and the presentation around the lessons learned in, the, in, in three areas. First of all, planning the deployment, because there was a considerable amount of planning that uh, had to take place. Um, but then also deploying SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage. And if I'm, I'm gonna start probably referring to them as SOC and SES. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, so. And then lastly, the validation of the environment prior to the application installation and things like that, okay? Um, and, then, uh, and then at the end, I'll wrap it up, kind of tell you a little bit more about it and show you some screenshots and all that kind of stuff. But again, let's make this an interactive session. If, if, if I miss something or if you have a question, please feel free to ask. So we announced uh, that the SAP cloud platform uh, will be uh, running on the IBM cloud in its private edition. The IBM cloud provides uh, isolation, security, uh, dedicated resources. So we feel like uh, it's a great fit for enterprises who may be hesitant to move to the cloud for some workloads and still want the innovation of the SAP cloud platform. When you look today in the market, customers want to have agility. They are looking for the cloud platform to drive absolutely new businesses coming out of total new developments and driving new experiences. So they say we need agility and a cloud platform delivers exactly this. And now is the situation that they come to points where they said, we love this, we love the cloud technology, we love the deployment, the speed, the innovation, but you know what, it's regulated. Coming from market condition, coming out of industries, coming out of their own company rules and regulations. And I'm um, saying, how can we get this whole HR platform in these environments? And this is exactly what the value is. They can get out of it, out of this partnership. 
We have uh, over 45 years of, uh, of combined uh, partnership and innovation across SAP and IBM. So I think this is a great uh, opportunity for customers to get that next level of innovation out of a cloud platform like the SAP uh, cloud platform, but do it in a way that's comfortable for enterprises that may have hesitation for uh, public cloud environments or multi-tenant environments. And so this provides that security and isolation uh, that you would get in an on-premises data center, uh, but with you know, the innovation that you can get from the SAP Cloud Platform. And it will lead customers in a situation that they have for dedicated solutions, they are looking for innovations or extensions, new developments, a private cloud environment. But on the other side, they can also go hybrid with other areas coming out of a public cloud, on-prem, or wherever they want. So at the end of the day, we are just expanding the solution offering for areas where the customers have specific needs, which is not available today. Customers can expect to see a rapid you know, time to uh, value, both in terms of what they get from the SAP Cloud Platform for their developers, but also with the IBM Cloud behind that, you have a managed experience that you don't have to you know, procure hardware, you don't have to set up software, configure and manage uh, that experience. So with IBM as, as the infrastructure underneath, uh, you have a private, secure environment, um, and then SAP Cloud Platform on top to be able to provide developers that innovation. What I see in the future, when you look at this intelligent enterprise, this is the clear vision. We will have to technology everywhere, it's embedded everywhere, but we also should be deployed on any kind of way, and this is exactly what it is. So this partnership will lead us to a point that wherever you need technology, in the right, I call it setup, that you can consume technology to get to new insights and drive business to next levels, that's what's possible now. Okay. So why did I start out with this? Because I think this was a great introduction to um, tell you a little bit about the, the reason why. And if you didn't pick up on it, the application that, um, that is driving this effort is the SAP Cloud Platform. And, and, and specifically, um, is anybody familiar with SAP Cloud Platform? A little bit? Okay, well, let me, let me tell you a little bit more about it. So, um, and this is right from SAP Cloud Platform, their website. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, um, you can click on the link and you can find this information. But it is an enterprise platform as a service offering, managed offering from SAP. Um, and, uh, and, and this is something that SAP has had for quite some time. It's, it's, um, it, it's actually in a multi-cloud configuration, multi-cloud hosted configuration but it uses shared infrastructure for the compute, the storage, and the network, and everything like that. Um, SAP has been actively promoting SCP, the, the SAP Cloud uh, Platform, um, but there are a number of customers that came back to SAP and said, this is great, we love the idea of um, having a platform, enterprise platform as a service being managed by somebody else. Um, that means I don't have to put in the effort of maintaining the infrastructure, maintaining everything, but I can't deal with the, 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 the multi aspect of it. I have security demands. I have um, reasons that I need to make sure that my environment is totally separated from any other customer's environment. And that is the genesis of SCP Private Edition, uh, SAP Cloud Platform Private Edition. It's basically customers that um, want this enterprise platform as service. They want the ease of just being able to use it. It's almost like a turnkey appliance in essence, um, but they need to be able to do it in their own dedicated platform instance. Um, they don't want to. Uh, they need to do it to meet data privacy and regulatory requirements. And 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 um, and uh, SCP Private Edition. They could deploy it on prem if they wanted to, but then they have to worry about acquiring hardware. They have to worry about acquiring the knowledge and doing all of the stuff to get it up and running. And it was, you know, it, and it is not a small task. I mean, it's there's a lot of pieces to make this thing work, and so. Um, they, many customers, SAP, SAP believe that many customers would prefer this as a hosted managed type of service where they don't have to think about any of the hardware and maintaining the infrastructure. So very quickly, let me explain um, a bit about the general architecture of SAP Cloud Platform. 
And um, as you can see, working from the bottom up, SAP Cloud Platform is, um, th this is the general architecture of the, the, the shared managed service environment where multiple customers can be connected. SAP has their own managed OpenStack infrastructure within an SAP data center that certain customers are connected to. Um, um, and, and, and those customers are using the enterprise PaaS. If, if there are customers that would prefer to use um, AWS or Azure or Google uh, Cloud Platform, SAP also has um, the Cloud Platform uh, managed service, but, um, but multi-tenant, and that's the key, multi-tenant. Um, um, deployment in those three top three public cloud providers. SAP Cloud Platform is Cloud Foundry. Okay, that's so. If you hadn't figured out by me saying enterprise platform as a service, that's exactly what it was all about. So it's SAP's implementation of Cloud Foundry um, versus you know Pivotal's implementation of Cloud Foundry or any other implementation of Cloud Foundry. It's optimized for SAP deployments, it's optimized for, de for developers developing against SAP applications and things like that. So that's why um, SAP created SAP Cloud Platform. And, and uh, then you can see at the top the, 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 the multi-tenant aspect of it. All the customers share the same infrastructure because there's a considerable amount of resources to get this infrastructure up and running, as you'll see here very shortly. So who here has had the opportunity to do much with Cloud Foundry? Okay, a little bit, a little bit. Okay, very good. For, for those of you that have, this'll, this probably will be you know, stuff that you already know, but for those of you that have not, um, Cloud Foundry actually um, is a combination of a number of technologies and capabilities and things like that. And one of the key technologies is this thing called Bosch. And Bosch actually handles the provisioning, the configuration, the orchestration for Cloud Foundry. I'm hoping everybody has been in the general sessions. And today's, uh, I think over the last couple of days, um, we've talked about SUSE's Cloud Foundry, which is fully containerized. And we also have talked about um, Cloud Application Platform 1.4 being released and how it is fully orchestrated by Kubernetes now. Kubernetes um, is and Bosch are similar. They're, they're, they mentioned this thing called Diego. There's a component within Bosch called Diego that actually handles the orchestration, the provisioning, and the configuration um, uh, of the Cloud Foundry environment. Bosch Diego does everything with virtual machines, where Cloud Application Platform from SUSE does everything with containers. Okay, so. Um, that's the second point. And basically all it's doing is it communicates with the virtualization layer via the cloud provider interface. And you can see that it, um, um, it, 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 it just has these directives to deal with disks or virtual machines or in Cloud Foundry terminology, these things called stem cells that are used to build up the Cloud Foundry environment. And then it's basically infrastructure as a service neutral. It can be, you know, the cloud provider interface can allow talking to VMware, talking to OpenStack, talking to public cloud provider, dot, dot, dot. Okay? So in this case, I'm talking about OpenStack. I've already mentioned SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage. Well, I'm kind of um, going down this path of, of the OpenStack integration. And, and actually, this is pretty cool. Um, if you've been with SUSE for a while, you may remember um, SUSECon several years ago where, um, uh, where SAP and SUSE announced working together on the OpenStack integration, the Bosch CPI for OpenStack integration. Um, and, and this is part of the reason I found out as I was doing my research and learning more about this. <clears throat> so this effort basically allowed CPI, the cloud provider interface, to communicate directly to OpenStack and be able to drive OpenStack you know, using OpenStack native APIs and things like that. Over on the right-hand side is the diagram of how all that works. 
yada, yada, yada. If you want more information about it, you can click in the lower right-hand corner. But basically, it, it, it can do things like work with the S3 interfaces. So if you have Swift or Ceph, in this case, we're talking SUSE Enterprise Storage, so we'll be talking about Ceph. It uses the Glance APIs, so Glance being the image repository, it's able to work with the image, work um, with Glance API and use those APIs to upload virtual machine images that then will be deployed um, and orchestrated by, by Bosch and Diego. And those interfaces also directly work with OpenStack Nova, you know, the compute part of OpenStack as well as interfacing with the networking piece, Neutron, and the block storage Cinder um, via, via Nova and via those APIs that are provided. And then credentials, it is able to work directly with Keystone, which is the credential provider for OpenStack. So um, hopefully everybody has a basic understanding of OpenStack because I'm going to get a little bit deeper into it. Um, so if for some reason there's, I bring up a topic that you don't understand or, or you'd like to get more information um, about OpenStack, <clears throat> feel free to stop me. I'm happy to, uh, uh, to dive in that a little bit deeper. So I digressed for a little bit to talk about Bosch I dig and talk about um, 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 the CPI, the OpenStack CPI. I'm going to come back to um, the SAP Cloud Platform and, and uh, basically um, um, the, the reason why um, we had to use SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage. It's because the SAP Cloud Platform, that's the managed service that's running in SAP's data center, is running SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage. Um, it's running SUSE OpenStack Cloud 7 and SUSE Enterprise Storage 5 as the infrastructure service technologies. When SAP um, um, uh, came up with the plans to do private edition, they said, let's just continue what we're doing and let's make SUSE OpenStack Cloud 7 and SUSE Enterprise Storage 5 the, the default infrastructure as a service option. That's why. And then IBM, in talking with SAP, um, um, said, you know what, we provide bare metal software support, or bare, not bare metal software, bare metal support in our um, cloud. So this is a great fit because customers can, we can, we can provide bare metal systems um, um, and then we can work with SUSE and with SAP to automate the provisioning and the deployment of SUSE OpenStack Cloud, SUSE Enterprise Storage, all of the components that get laid on top of it uh, for, uh, for uh, 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 SCP private edition. So it all sounded great. And what's really cool is um, the SCP Cloud Platform Private Edition Infrastructure Guide specifically calls out SUSE OpenStack Cloud 7 and, and SUSE Enterprise Storage 5. And within that infrastructure guide, it outlines and recommends lots of different things. And I'll go through some of these things over the next few slides, but things like the server requirements what your network link requirements are. Hey, this is SAP, so availability, making it highly available, making it, you know, so nothing can fail, you know, um, you know the chance of a, of a full system failure. So this in, they, they introduced this, you know, taking advantage of OpenStack availability zones. High availability, they have uh, outlines and recommendations for the OpenStack control layer, the compute layer, the storage layer, and even getting down to specifics, those of you that were, have worked with SUSE OpenStack Cloud, specific configuration options for the OpenStack bar clamps that we have with our admin server. So it's quite a large document, and, and uh, I, I won't be showing that document today. But uh, basically, um, to sum it up, the goal of this project, um, um, let, me, let me take a step back. So back at Sapphire a year ago, um, was when we were first contacted um, by SAP and IBM for assistance. And we, uh, um, we were asked to actually prove out um, very quickly, could something like this be done? And I, I worked very closely with uh, one of the SEs out of uh, the SUS uh, sales engineers out of Germany that had been working on this for quite some time. And, uh, and we were able to get what we call a, um, um, a what we call the Sapphire POC environment. Okay, it was just to demonstrate to Sapphire attendees that this is a possible option if you're looking at 
SCP Private Edition. From that, um, there was enough interest that SAP and IBM, and they were leading the charge. We were kind of, I was kind of helping them from a support perspective and from my solution architect role, but they were leading the charge and they said, we'd like to go ahead and go to the next step. We'd like to create a customer ready proof of concept environment that will host uh, um, SCP Private Edition for customers that are interested, up to 10 customers. Not focusing on customer confidential data, but showing them the capabilities of the platform. So they could kick the tires, they could see how it worked, they could um, um, you know, um, make sure that they understood you know, how it worked with an IBM cloud, how it worked all together, and, and things like that. Because many of these customers may have never even tried um, SAP um, uh, cloud platform before. Um, <clears throat> where the Sapphire POC environment was very much um, get it done as quickly as you can, we basically had, were given um, 10 days to get it done. So in 10 days, we deployed SUS OpenStack Cloud, SUS Enterprise Storage, um, and, and made sure all the components were working properly. We didn't have time to focus on availability of the control plane. We didn't have time to focus on any security, uh, you know, certificates, SSL, community based communications, anything like that. We didn't really go through any performance metrics to see if we'd meet the performance requirements. So, so ultimately this environment, we wanted to as closely mimic a productive deployment minus availability zones because that threw us a little bit of a curveball, and, and we needed to do some more research. Um, um, the, the, you know, the way the IBM Cloud implements um, their, their pods, and they deal with availability zones and things like that. Tim knows what I'm talking about. It, it, it kind of took, it would take a more engineering and more architecture, architecting time, and it wasn't something we wanted to do at this point. <clears throat> but ultimately, what we wanted to do is use this environment to learn and as a test bed for future deployments. The initial intent was every customer would have their own um, separate environment, totally dedicated to themselves. So we needed not only to um, uh, be able to do this once, but we needed to rapidly repeat this over and over and over and over again. Okay, everybody understand the goal? All right, now comes the fun part where we're gonna talk about IBM Cloud and then I'll get a little further in and I'll talk about actually the stuff that we did and the lessons learned. So um, a little bit about IBM Cloud and, 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 um, and Tim, please, because you're the resident expert here, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if I say something wrong, please correct me. But uh, um, bef prior to this, um, I hadn't really done a lot with you know, hands-on work in IBM Cloud but I had done a little bit of research and, 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 and things like that. And so this is from that research as I was uh, um, starting to work with the IBM Cloud team. But um, IBM Cloud, uh, what was the soft layer group, um, ha um, has always done bare metal servers. They've always, for as long as they've been around, I believe bare metal server support was one of their um, um, standards. And that was one of their differentiators. And so they basically had very flexible configuration options. You know, some of um, uh, uh, the popular configurations, you know, that had, you know, with number of cores, the speed, the RAM, the number of drives are all preset. They could provision them very quickly in 30 to 40 minutes, um, probably with a, def uh, with, a, with a default operating system of your choice. Um, uh, they also have custom that take a little bit longer to provision, but gives more variety with regards to the types of servers, the cores, the speeds, the RAMs, the drives. And then, the, and then where SUSE came into the picture um, um, back in 2017 and when it was released in, in early 2018 is around SAP certified. So SLES for SAP applications runs on these bare metal systems and is fully certified by IBM Cloud and SAP anywhere from large to small size, sizes and things like that, specifically for HANA deployments and things. Um, well, those flexible configuration options you, as you'll see here in a little bit, um, they didn't quite work for us for, for what this project needed for this, um, for this customer POC environment. So we had to go down to the can be ordered, um, you know, a custom configuration with being ordered uh, without an operating system um, because SLES is not a, um, 
uh, an available OS option out of the box uh, you know, uh, within the portal of IBM Cloud. There are ongoing discussions about adding SUSE Linux Enterprise Server as an available option, but at this point, we had to do a very customized configuration um, in addition to the customized OS, or um, we actually ordered the systems without. Um, and all of this was basically done by the IBM team. I was directly involved in the sizing um, and, and those pieces of it. But when it came down to who did the work and who put in the requisition and all this kind of stuff, it was IBM doing that on, on my behalf. Um, <clears throat> within, so that's the compute side of the house for IBM Cloud, bare metal servers and all that kind of stuff. The network configuration, they have three, dif three distinct types of networks. They've got their public network, uh, public interfaces on their bare metal servers. Those are directly uh, connected or can directly access the internet. Um, um, each host has a redundant pair of 10 gigabit per second ethernet connections. Um, um, and, and these literally have um, can be given a public IP address and can get straight out to the internet or straight in from the internet. Um, there's also the private. So behind the scenes, if you want to have um, private connectivity between the compute nodes, you can do that with the IBM Cloud private network. Um, it also connects uh, to other uh, IBM Cloud um, services in their worldwide set of data centers. And, and it kind of washes out, I apologize, but uh, when you download this presentation, um, this PDF, you'll actually, um, behind it is, a, is, a, is the, the, the map of the IBM Cloud worldwide data centers and all of their data centers and all of their um, uh, places. They've, they've got uh, data centers and uh, points of presence and, and, and even federal data centers. And then lastly, um, uh, they, the management network. Um, that's out of band, that's used for IPMI connections or uh, BMC connections. That's where I was able to access you know, VPN in and, and be able to touch the systems, tell them to reboot, um, be able to start the installation and thing like, things like that. So that's a very high level introduction to IBM Cloud um, you know, the, from the compute side and from the network side. And that's really the basics that I needed to know as the architect um, as one of the architects at SUSE working on trying to get this all set up. So now let's talk about planning the deployment and lessons that I learned from planning the deployment. So this is where it starts to get fun. Um, up to this point, you've been looking at a lot of, a lot of text and, and things like that, and I apologize. But now you get to look at some pictures. And this is actually um, the diagram that uh, we put together as we were architecting what and how this implementation might be deployed in IBM Cloud. Um, <clears throat> so typically when you order a bare metal server from IBM Cloud, you get two interfaces that are connected to the public network and two interfaces that are connected to the private network. Because of the higher level of security that we wanted to focus on in this project, it was decided to actually have the two interfaces that are connected to the public network connected to the private network as well. And that's, um, and then bonded together. So you can see bond zero and bond one represented the, the, the bonds uh, of the physical devices connecting to the, the private network. Um, up here in the upper left-hand corner, you see um, the, the, the blue, um, the, what represents the Viata firewall. And so, Again, focusing on security, they wanted to restrict how people got in, where people could go, and things like that to this environment. Um, let's see, and then, and then um, portable IP addresses. I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. But let me just kind of give you an idea. Um, so you know, here's the internet in the upper left-hand corner. Um, we use the, the, the virtual machine host. So this is a KVM host running SLES and KVM. And on that machine, we would run our SUSE OpenStack Cloud administration server and our SUSE Enterprise Storage administration server as virtual machines. Everything else, all the other systems to the right of the VM host are all physical systems at that point. So we had three um, OpenStack control nodes, SUSE OpenStack Cloud 7 control nodes. We had um, eight, open, well, six OpenStack compute nodes and two OpenStack 
compute nodes that were, that were labeled pets, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. Um, we had a, a Ceph uh, gateway, um, a, Rod a Rados gateway for object storage. Uh, so that OpenStack could communicate and, and Bosch could say, provision these disks, provision this, you know, provision this object storage, um, 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 and, and things like that for the Glance repository or also for um, direct usage by the, by the virtual machines, the instances. We had uh, several Ceph monitors. Actually, it shows kind of two there, but there were actually three Ceph monitors um, per SUSE recommendations in um, SUSE Enterprise Storage Deployment. And then we had um, four highly populated um, Ceph storage nodes. And then you can see the networking and, and the names of the networks. If you've worked with SUSE OpenStack Cloud before, you're familiar with the admin network. You're familiar with the public and API LAN. Um, these are things of uh, the cloud SDN. The, uh, um, those, are com um, those, are, those networks are defined as part of the Crowbar deployment, if you're familiar with Crowbar and all that kind of stuff. So we basically had to take and translate what was happening uh, with uh, um, and the configuration in SUSE OpenStack Cloud and try and translate that into the IBM Cloud way of doing things. And, and, and what made it easier is this, these portable um, IP uh, ranges that we used for each uh, VLAN. So let me go ahead and, and show you what that looks like. So basically, um, um, every, bare, every bare metal system that uh, gets ordered in IBM Cloud gets an IP address uh, um, uh, automatically assigned to it, but they may not be in a contiguous range. They, they could be all over the place is what I found. Um, when talking to one of their network architects, um, she had told me the best thing to do is get these portable IP addresses, which is uh, something that customers can do. These are contiguous ranges of IP addresses that are assigned to, a, to an individual VLAN. And so each of those um, each of those pipes, bond zero and bond one, each of those little pipes inside of the bigger pipes, those are all VLANs. And so I was able to actually request portable IP addresses, contiguous ranges, and then I took that information and I used portions of those IP addresses in the SUSE OpenStack Cloud Network JSON file. And that was, and if you're familiar with the with the Network JSON file, that's the file that is read as SUSE OpenStack Cloud um, is being deployed and is used for the admin network or the public API network. Or, and, and, and why do I have two public API networks? Well, well we basically said um, we, um, we didn't know how many um, floating IP addresses would be needed by Cloud Foundry. So we basically separated um, into two separate, um, two separate um, IP domains. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the IP addresses that would be assigned to the individual systems that made up the OpenStack environment, you know, to like the, the, uh, the Horizon dashboard, the IP address that you'd access the Horizon dashboard or anything like that. And then we, we dedicated a whole 26 sitter subnet range to Nova floating IP addresses because we didn't know how many, and, and SAP at the time couldn't tell us. They said they gave us a range, and we said, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll just kind of go with, uh, we'll go with this, and, and, and it was a long conversation about it. But um, that, that right there is, is a, a great example of, of, you know, it took us quite a lot of time to understand how all of these pieces go together. Um, we had a basic idea of it when we did the Sapphire POC environment, you know, the, you know what we had to do in 10, 10 days. But ultimately, um, we had to really refine what we did um, for a productive deployment. So switching from the networking, now to talk about the compute um, portion of it. So this is from um, the infrastructure guide, and these are some of the example server recommendations. And so you, I, I won't go through each of these, but you can see these are pretty beefy machines that SAP is recommending. Um, and so we were able to take this stuff, um, and, uh, and, and uh, um, I, I think we actually, IBM did a great job um, by, um, by upping the game of the types of servers that we deployed. So as you can see, um, as I kind of showed in the, the, the diagram a couple slides ago, um, now you can see actually the numbers. We did um, you know, one KVM host running SLES, 
all the information about it, the, ne the network gateway, that Viata device that I was talking about, three OpenStack control nodes. Why did we use three? Isn't two acceptable for high availability? Yes, yes, it is, but is it recommended? No. It's actually better to have three because of, uh, of split brain type issues and things like that. And we could distribute the load even a little bit more um, um, in our configuration. Six um, OpenStack compute nodes that are focused on Cloud Foundry applications. So these are the applications that SAP creates that work with Cloud Foundry that application developers can use and things like that. Those um, OpenStack compute nodes used local storage for high performance. You can see there's a seven terabyte usable, um, um, uh, seven terabytes of usable space in a RAID 5 configuration. Those Cloud Foundry apps wanted as fast to drive as possible. With the Sapphire POC, they did all SSD drives. In this, they were, they were using some spinners and things like that. Just save on costs and things. Um, and then the two other OpenStack compute nodes, the PETs, those are actually um, um, used for customer applications and whatever they needed. And those didn't have any local usable storage. Um, they would use uh, the Ceph cluster for object storage or for block storage you know, from Cinder and things like that. The Ceph monitors, there are three of them. We've got the object gateway for, uh, for um, uh, for Rados uh, and object storage connections, and then four um, OSD nodes. And you can see um, this is, the, these are amazing um, amount of uh, storage that was available uh, to the cluster. And we actually used a lot of the storage uh, after we got the whole environment up and running. Any questions? All right, so, um, so I think we've all learned that any IT project planning is very important, but planning was was critical in this. You know, trying to understand what SAP was what wanted to accomplish and what the performance metrics are and things like that. Um, it it took a lot of we had um, a weekly um, actually two calls per week, and we call them our Scrum calls where we were working on this, and we had IBM engineers. SAP engineers and SUSE engineers. And SAP was still kind of in the process of, of um, working out and developing the documentation. So some of this was kind of hit and miss. One minute they'd say one thing and then they'd come back and, oh, we, had to, we got to redo this. And I was like, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was fun. It was fun, but it was sometimes stressful because we'd have to change the configuration slightly. But understanding the application requirements really helped in sizing this this customer POC environment. It helped um, also to understand, you know, what features were important for the customer POC environment. It was SAP and IBM that, that decided what features were the most important for this customer POC environment. Again, I mentioned security, availability, and monitoring, and, and things like that. They were all able to identify what that meant at a high level um, in the planning portion of it. Um, Large amount of time was spent, I think I've already mentioned this many times, but in translating the IBM cloud network capabilities, you know, the public, the private, um, those are, and, and, and saying, well, we don't really want public because we don't want to open up this network to, you know, security of vulnerabilities. Let's make them both private. You know, that was all very important and, and, and it worked out very well. I would say of our calls, we probably spent um, two and a half weeks worth of, of one hour calls, uh, you know, two times a week, just talking about the network design, making sure that we understood it, making sure that all the pieces were understood and how it would work. And then basically um, fitting the server requirements. Um, we tried to fit it into the popular server configuration, but uh, to save some money, but at the same time, there were some customizations that we needed to do just because of the networking and because of some of the SSDs that we needed for the Ceph nodes and things like that. All right, hopefully I'm not boring you too much with this stuff. <sighs> but it, it was really cool. It's 13 months of, of effort to, to, to work on this stuff. So, so, so um, we probably spent, oh, I would say a couple months, maybe a month and a half. No, about a couple months before we actually got to even start deploying. So I think it was July when we started, you know, July of 2018. 
that we officially kicked off the efforts of planning the environment. It wasn't until September or October that we actually started deploying. And to um, and and I would have loved to do the deployment all myself, but I didn't want to be a, a hog. I actually asked our consulting team to get you know see if I could get a couple of the consultants. You know uh, Jeff Price, you know the drummer of the Sousa band. Um, he helped out um, as well as a new uh, SUSE consultant that was just hired on. They came on board around, I think, the sem September time frame. And, sh and around that time is when we started deploying SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage. The next three slides that I'm going to show you are actually the, re the report that we gave to IBM and SAP based on what we learned from the deployment. And I was directly involved in some of the deployment. I helped with some of the pieces of it, but I tried to let our consulting team pick up and run with it because this is a pretty cool project. A lot of hardware, a lot of really cool things. They also too, when they came on board, they reviewed the design parameters that we had. So there was a little bit of, you know, they would look back at what we did and said, Mike, you, you did it okay. There isn't something stupid you did. So again, um, this is the implementation feedback. So these are the exact slides. I, I made a few minor modifications um, to change the, the tense uh, from, uh, from it just happened to it, it happened in the past. But otherwise, you know, things like really basic things like um, um, uh, when I first had to install the KVM host, I took care of that. I needed to um, change the boot order. Um, um, some of the compute nodes, um, we, we chose to, um, uh, they, they didn't have Pixie enabled. Uh, we used the normal open, uh, SUSE OpenStack Cloud way of deploying um, nodes via Pixie. Um, we learned later on that it's not the way that we want to do it. And as you can see on the, uh, the future, um, we um, decided that f for any future deployments, we would always do hard drive first and then IBM, the IBM team would actually build an image um, or it wasn't really an image, they would actually have automation in place to do an Autoyast deployment of SUSE Linux Enterprise Server. So we'd lay down a basic SUSE Linux Enterprise Server 12, Service Pack 3, and, uh, and everything. But, but for this, we didn't know any better, so we said, well, let's do Pixie, and, and, it, and well, okay, it worked okay, but we found a couple of compute nodes that had to be changed. We found that um, as, we, as we got into installing um, SUSE OpenStack Cloud and SUSE Enterprise Storage, the, the, the SOC admin node and the SES admin node needed to talk on all these different VLANs. And so, um, as you can see, the SES admin VM uh, virtual machine, the KVM virtual machine that was the SES admin node, had to be trunked to the storage replication and the storage client VLANs. Otherwise, it wouldn't install. The installer just literally died. The Salt installer died. Um, so we had to do that. We had to make sure that the, the Swift was trunked to VLAN 3506. And, and, and I won't go through, I, I probably should have Maybe I'll update that, what that VLAN is, but I think that was, well, I don't remember what that VLAN, now it's no big deal. But ultimately you get the idea that for the most part, the VLAN's configuration work, but in some cases, you know, it, it just need a little tweaks here and there. And, and really from the time that the hardware was ordered, so we did our planning, the IBM team um, ordered the hardware. I think the hardware was available like in, in less than a week. So it was literally very fast. So for, for these little itty bitty problems, in my opinion, it was, they actually were very fast getting it up and running. You know, we had some IPMI issues, like the SOC PET one, um, um, not, just for whatever reason, the remote console, the IPMI stopped working. I guess a board died and they had to replace a board or something like that, I don't know, I, something. It was, I said, okay, that's fine. Um, they apologized and, and all that kind of stuff. but. Um, you know, the, as we got into it, um, Jeff Price and, and Steve, Steve Becht, who are the, the SUSE consultants that helped out with this, um, they were given the, the, the infrastructure guide. And the infrastructure guide said, we need you to do these configurations beyond the normal SUSE opens that cloud deployment. And, and the guide was written um, um, for a much larger deployment. And we found out that several configurations started breaking the cluster, started breaking OpenStack, 
because the, uh, the, 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 the configurations just were way out of whack for the number of, of compute nodes that we had. So we, ha so we basically made a recommendation to SAP that we needed a smaller version for customers that, or for smaller deployments. Because um, uh, we knew that not every customer is going to go to the size of, of the, the private edition deployment that was managed in the SAP data center right off the bat. They're probably going to start small and grow over time. So we need to be able to start for smaller deployments, optimal configuration, and, and, and select optional configuration options as needed. And then as the environment grows, the, the document can say, you know, as it gets to this point, go ahead and change these parameters. Or you may want to think about changing these parameters. SAP thought that was a good approach. Uh, with regards to SUSE OpenStack Cloud, um, you know, we had a handover document uh, that we that we worked uh, with IBM. So IBM provisioned the hardware. They provided um, a, a spreadsheet, and in that spreadsheet was all the MAC addresses for every one of the NICs in every one of the servers. So we knew exactly what we needed to do and which MAC address we needed to target and all that kind of stuff. And and then we used that handover document. Um, um, it was given to me, and then we used the handover document for our SOC and CES planning. And then once we were done with SOC and CES, we gave it back to IBM so that they knew how to connect to the systems and all that kind of stuff. Little things, but for the most part, I would say that uh, we didn't really have too many problems, except, except when we got into publicly signed certificates. Remember the security and SSL certificates I mentioned? They wanted to have secure communications with customers and all that. And, and I'll, we found some, some major bugs within SSL certificates and SUSE OpenStack Cloud. Had to get engineering on the phone, and, and they submitted fixes. Uh, they gave us fixes, and then, they, um, and then they were subsequently patched in updates for SUSE OpenStack Cloud. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. We used the wildcard certificate for, uh, for um, the, the pacemaker bar clamp. And you can see public.sapcp.cloud.ibm.com. Uh, that was the domain name for accessing the, um, uh, the Horizon dashboard. Okay. A little bit more. So um, who here has deployed SUSE OpenStack Cloud? Anybody? SUSE OpenStack Cloud? So um, you know, with SUSE OpenStack Cloud, um, if you deploy it via Pixie, if you deploy the nodes via Pixie, the names of the nodes, the host names of the nodes, are deployed as MAC addresses. You know, D and then the MAC address and something like that. That became a huge pain as we continued down the path of troubleshooting and working in the systems. So one of the things that we recommended and, and was accepted was um, instead of um, um, instead of using MAC addresses for host names, we would actually use real host names like SOC Control 1, SOC Control 2, SOC Control 3, SOC Compute 1, SOC Pet 1, and things like that. And that actually worked out really well because we were using AutoYast as well to deploy. So it made it, it made it really fast. So if, you, if you've never worked in a large SUSE OpenStack Cloud deployment, the Crowbar-based deployment, um, I definitely recommend you know keep existing host name. That, that right there was huge for us. SUSE Enterprise Storage, really, that was really easy. That went in no problem at all. The biggest thing was um, in talking with one of the guys on my team, and, and for those SUSE people here, David Byte, who's Mr. SUSE Enterprise Storage, from an architect perspective, uh, from a solution architect perspective, he basically, um, as soon as I told him about this health warn message, he immediately said, you just, you, you messed up on your uh, Ceph uh, PG calculations and you should have used this PG calculator. I'm like, oh, okay. I mean, I didn't know. I went off of what was in our documentation and it, it's, it, it's changed. Um, the Ceph community has changed things, making it better, making it easier, making it faster. I was still using old information. And then the other thing um, on the, uh, Let's see, the SES admin node, um, because it's using salt to manage all the jobs and all that kind of stuff and maintain the environment. Um, literally, that thing just kept running and running and running, and we ran out of, of, of space. No, uh, inodes, actually. And uh, we had to go in, and it's documented in, in the SUSE Enterprise Storage documentation as something when you're running SUSE Enterprise Storage in production. Um, you run up, you fill up these uh, job cache and, and keep job logs and all this kind of stuff, and you'd run out of inodes. Well, we did it. I didn't know, but 
I got it fixed. It was easy to fix. So the biggest thing is, and, and, and you know, if you're going to be doing a SUS OpenStack Cloud or SUSE Enterprise, a SUSE OpenStack Cloud um, and SUSE Enterprise Storage deployment, my recommendation, and I told this to the, the consultants, we should have started out of the box. We shouldn't have gone and, and started tweaking every bit of the configuration options that SAP had in their infrastructure deployment guide. We would have saved ourselves a week and a half worth of troubleshooting why things kept breaking. But so, you know, we learn. Um, don't always immediately customize the configuration based on the application documentation. I already mentioned the auto-generated host names based on MAC addresses. When trying to talk with SAP engineers and IBM engineers and trying to explain the MAC address, everybody had to have this translation table in front of them. It was crazy. If we would have had it already just been SOC Compute 1, boop, we would have known. It would have been so much easier. And then, um, and then I, I, I kudos to IBM Cloud and the support team. I literally, I never had a problem. I opened up a support request and, and literally there's a great little chat tool they have on their, on, on their um, portal. And I would chat with an engineer and most issues like IPMI access or boot order or even of the failing NIC were solved very quickly. IBM Cloud support engineers do a great job. Okay, validation of the environment. How am I doing on time? I'm doing pretty good. Okay, validation of the environment. Um, very quickly, um, so this is where really the handoff st um, started to happen. Um, SUSE, um, we did less, IBM did more. Because at this point, the, the, the OpenStack environment, the enterprise storage environment are up and running. IBM wanted to take the lead uh, with regards to deploying uh, the open the, the cloud foundry components the the, the you know, actual application so literally I did very little with this but I did help um, the IBM engineers with regards to some of the validation recommendations so this is just an example of some of the tools that were used like the cloud foundry openstack validator that's something that was created by the cloud foundry um, team um, to validate um, is OpenStack ready uh, for Cloud Foundry deployment? That passed with flying colors. Tools like Rally and Shaker, um, these are recommendations by SAP um, to go ahead and make sure that certain capabilities and functions were working properly within SUSE OpenStack Cloud. Um, also be able to test the availability of certain components um, like the control plane or RabbitMQ and, and, and things like that. We didn't have to test the availability zone. Remember I mentioned at the beginning, we didn't do any AZ type of stuff in this deployment. Again, some more shaker tests around network performance tests and also Rados gateway tests. Um, you know, I don't know if we did any of the get put GP multi or GP suite. It was the IBM engineer that was doing most of it and she she was very good at what she did, so I almost never, she, she told me if there was a problem. And that's kind of what I say here in the lessons learned. So the biggest problem was is finding and using the testing tools took a bit of effort. That's where I helped out the most with, with just trying to find the, the, the tools like Shaker and, and all the ones that I mentioned. And, but once we found them, um, it wasn't that hard. Um, you know, like I said, not all the tests applied to the POC environment. And when we had to run a test, most of them ran successfully on the first run. When we found that one didn't run successfully, you know, IBM really focused on pinpointing the reason for the failure. And if they found it was a problem within our configuration, they called and said, we need an adjustment or you need a change or you know, something like that. But honestly, I think I received one call to make one adjustment. And, all of the, and they had a number of failures, but nothing was affecting by me. They found some bugs and some code and, and, and the test suites and all that kind of stuff. And, but otherwise, it, was, it worked really well. So wrapping up. So this is what it kind of looks like. I apologize. It makes it really hard to see because it gets washed out. But as you can see, here are the, the eight. I think those are eight, yeah, displaying eight items um, down in the lower left-hand corner. Um, displaying, these are the eight compute nodes, you know, the, 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 the two pet nodes plus the six compute nodes that are for the Cloud Foundry applications. And you can see how many virtual CPUs, how many was used. One thing that caught my attention, I never really noticed it, 
There's 75 virtual CPU used, but there's only uh, 72 virtual CPU on that one server. I didn't understand that. I didn't really spend any time. It wasn't causing us any problems, so hey, but I just kept on, I kept on going. But you can see how much RAM was used, how much total RAM is available. Um, a lot, these machines had a lot of RAM. It was, it was very nice. The amount of local storage, how much was being used. Um, and then kind of give you an idea of the number of instances. And, and we didn't create these instances. So these were all Bosch created. These were all Cloud Foundry created automatically. Um, they, they happened to be Ubuntu based images. So we were running Ubuntu virtual in, uh, machines um, and instances in uh, and on SUS OpenStack Cloud. It worked great. They deployed, no problem, actually worked, worked very well. Here is some of the instances. So you can see landscape trial is our project, uh, is what we called it, uh, what IBM called it specifically. And just this is kind of a, a again, I apologize, this is because it's washed out, but you can see um, Bosch, OpenStack, KVM, Ubuntu, Trusty, and then you know the name of the agent and whatever its job in life was from a, from a Cloud Foundry perspective. And they were literally, I don't remember, it was like over 150 different instances that were automatically provisioned and being monitored and maintained and restarted if there was a failure. All of that was being hap happened by Bosch and Diego. Volumes, so this is the landscape trial connecting to the SUSE Enterprise Storage and utilizing SUSE Enterprise Storage. So you know, just a lot of those connections as well to kind of give you an idea of, of, of what it looked like. Um, why, am I, why am I not showing you this live? Well, I'll explain this here in a minute. Um, networks, you can see a lot of networks were automatically created by Bosch and things. DMZ network, uh, Docker services, and a whole bunch of stuff. And this is all Cloud Foundry stuff. I didn't bother myself with any of this. I didn't even ask. It, as long as it worked properly in OpenStack and worked properly with SUSE Enterprise Storage, from my perspective, I was happy. Um, uh, I felt my portion of, of the project was complete. So why didn't I show you this stuff live? Well, you'll see here on the third bullet, but, but IBM completed the SCP private edition deployment with SAP's assistance. They did find some bugs in SAP code. SAP was still developing some of this stuff along the way. So as IBM was deploying it, they found a problem. SAP was fixing it. Um, we were in the process of discussing the POC customer onboarding, um, what, what it was gonna take to make it work, the procedures, going through the tests and all that were being developed. And then um, about, um, about uh, eight weeks ago, six, eight weeks ago, um, SAP came back and said, we're reevaluating what we're doing um, and uh, looking at our architecture and deployment options. And at that point, it was decided to cancel the project. And so all of that work, you know, months of work, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that was my baby for several months. And I was connected to the system all the time, just making sure it was working fine. We were in the process of discussing how to monitor the environment to make sure that, you know, if there was a problem with it. Um, we, we discussed utilizing, um, um, I'm having a brain fart. Um, what's, the, what's the monitoring tool for OpenStack? Manaska. They didn't. They, they thought Manasco was a bit too heavy. They were looking at you know some lighter weight stuff that they could do. So we were discussing some of that. We were going to get engineering involved, and the rug was pulled from out from underneath us. So I had about a, about a week and a half before I, to gather as much information from the lab. So I ran a whole bunch of support configs. I, I gathered as much information, which I'll keep for historical purposes. But the environment has been since destroyed. Um, and, and, but you know, that even though the project has been canceled, I, I, a lot of knowledge and experience has been gained from this project. It's been a great project. Yes, sir, Raj. Can you to tell me specifically what has been canceled, the project for putting the SAP Cloud Platform on? On, um, so, so um, yes, the, so SAP Cloud Platform Private Edition I, is not canceled from a product perspective, but how it's deployed utilizing um, OpenStack, using, utilizing infrastructure as a service, that is being reevaluated and things like that, looking at alternatives. And you probably can guess by just listening to the keynotes this week and some of the things around containers and container orchestration, maybe that's where it's going. We haven't had confirmation, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that might be 
part of it because uh, um, you know SAP is heavily involved and IBM is heavily involved in contributing to um, the, the containerized Cloud Foundry efforts and Kubernetes driving um, it instead of Bosch and, and Diego and things like that. So um, with that, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you may know I'm a storage guy. Okay. Why only the one route of gateway? Um, so because at that point it was able to service all of the requests that was needed, um, we had that discussion. Um, we um, actually, one of our consultants in Germany that works with SAP in their managed data center, um, he actually, we, we, I didn't consult with him directly, but the engineer in Germany that was helping me, he consulted with him, and, and for the size of the environment, we only needed one Rados gateway. Um, but it was always planned to add more Rados gateways and load balance those um, if, if the need came up. Okay, well, and, and more to the point, surely uh, the, the availability is, is really what I'm after here. Is yep. If that were to go down, what would be yeah. high availability? Um, yeah, so you, that's a good point and probably something I um, probably should have thought about a little bit more. But, um, but uh, basically, um, because the core Cloud Foundry apps were running natively on the disks and things like that, um, once the environment was up and running, um, um, it was you know, the Cloud Foundry infrastructure really didn't need to access a lot of block uh, uh, object and block storage on the SES cluster. So it wasn't really needed, but ultimately we would have probably we would have probably said, "How stupid are we for not adding another?" So yeah, a good point, very good point. Hey, I didn't say I was a great solution architect. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually not used at all. I don't think. Yeah, we we did talk about it, and we did have contingency plans. But we were kind of like letting it ride at that point because of the cost. Um, we were trying to see what you know for this POC environment, what could we do? But good question. All right. So. What does you want to trust with that you have to do? You okay. said you have you got one call to do one project change. I'd have to go back to my notes. It, it, it was a minor little thing. I, I can I definitely can look it up. I just don't remember right off the top of my head. But I, I recorded all the changes that I had made and things like that. And actually, I be, we have it was quite a fun project because um, the IBM team we had a um, change control, we had a, um, um, log management, we, we had a whole bunch of things going on. We were making sure that you know we were working on the the blueprint and the practices for doing this in a more productive environment. Um, and and I didn't explain this in these slides, but I'll, I'll just take a moment. So we also had created a. Um, an open source project under um, GitHub slash IBM, where we would actually start working on um, automating the deployment of the infrastructure piece of it, automating the deployment of the operating system, SUSE OpenStack Cloud, SUSE Enterprise Storage. I started on that effort, and then as soon as the, the rug was pulled out, well, I kind of stopped on it. I, I kept all of my work, um, but, uh, but ultimately um, I got up to the point of automating the deployment of the KVM host and both of the SOC admin node and the SAS admin node, and that's where I stopped. Um, um, so, okay, um, one last thing. Remember to evaluate the session. Hopefully I didn't bore you too much. Hopefully you found this is exciting, but it did take a long time. It was exciting for me. Hopefully I at least shared a little bit of the excitement and the things that I learned um, in, in working with IBM and SAP. Thank you.